Welcome to this Meet the Author session. Uh, today we are going to talk about Cisco's digital network architecture, Intent Based Network Gear for Enterprise. My name is Hilda Ortiega and I am a community manager of the Cisco community and the host of today's event. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today, either you're in morning time, afternoon, or evening time. And thank you, Tim, Matias, Dave, and Simone, and well, for, for joining us and making this session possible. We are really thankful and honored to have this opportunity to collaborate with you on this Meet the Authors event. Well, on this session, uh, what is going to happen and how we are going to move on if, if this is the first time you're joining this kind of event? Well, at the beginning, we will have the opportunity to know more about the authors, their story, and the story even behind this book, and um, some details about them as well. Then they will share some trends and key content of the book and about Cisco's DNA. And at the end, we will have a special moment just to clarify some of the questions that you post on this Q&A panel or on the chat panel uh, verbally. All right. So uh, let's get started. Oh, sorry, this got bigger. And alternative, I would just would like to mention to you that this, in this event, we have a great great opportunity for all of the attendees. You will have the opportunity to win a free signed copy of this book. Yes, that is correct, signing by these great authors. And uh, we have two. So how you can win? Well, just stay with us and uh, on this session and you will get this opportunity. So let's get started with this event. And thank you once again, everybody for joining us and particularly to these authors, uh, well, you are very savvy and knowledgeable and, and very well known, not only for being Cisco consultants, also many of you for being principal engineers, even a doctor, directors, and distinguished engineers, speakers, among many other titles that you have. So uh, with all this kind of background, there are indeed so many questions that we would like to ask you. But well, let's get started with the beginning just to, to get so, Team, uh, Matt, uh, Dave, and Simone, uh, my first question to you will be there, how you guys get started into tech? And don't yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I can take that one if you want to, or kick off. Uh, this is Dave Zachs. Um, I've been involved in technology, involved me, meaning, meaning having a job that actually pays money uh, since 1979. I've been doing networks since 85. Um, I got my start way back in the day doing uh, modem dial-up and computer repair and all sorts of things like that. Um, I still have the motherboard from my original Apple II Plus computer uh, that I had back in the day with 48K of RAM and um, yeah, so go back, a long, go back a long ways in the computer industry. Dave, why don't you tell about the first paper that you ever wrote? How old were you? <laughs> what oh, sure. was it yeah. and uh, what that, did you get for it? Yeah, no, I, I can talk about that. So so um, I could go grab it off the shelf here if you want. Um, there was a magazine, most people probably, most people probably remember Byte Magazine, B-Y-T-E Magazine. So there was a precursor to Byte Magazine called Kilobaud Microcomputing, a thousand bits per second, right? And uh, so I was in drafting class, I was in um, grade eight, so I would have been about uh, 14 years old. And so this would have been in, or, no, I guess I was 16 years old, 15 or 16. And um, anyway, uh, in drafting class, your assignment was to draw a picture of a house for the year. And uh, I'd already drawn my picture of the house and I was kind of bored when I came into class every day, I had nothing to do. So I sat down and wrote an article for this magazine called Kilobod Baker Computing, which was on new memory technologies. And it was about some things that have, we use today, like charge coupled devices and cameras and, and uh, static DRAM. And other things were, you know, stuff that sunk out of sight, like bubble memory. Uh, but I wrote this site unseen for this magazine that I was reading, sent it into them, and they paid me, I think it was $70, $75 at the time, which is a lot of money when you're like 15 years old in 1979. And um, so, yeah, that was the first thing I ever got published. That's a cool story. Hey, Simone, how did you get started? I, I was actually picked from university. Uh, you know, Cisco has this uh, programs where they, they come to university and they, you know, do a pitch. And I was really 
hit, you know, from from this guy who was telling everything about Cisco, how, how cool they were. And uh, and I decided that, okay, this guy uh, seems to be pretty cool. And uh, I had the opportunity uh, right uh, after my master degree to go and uh, join directly in um, in San Jose. So I, I started as a as a software engineer, I was writing code on the 6500. So pretty, pretty interesting. interesting. What about you, Matt? Well, I my first um, touch points with technology was a little box that was called a a ZX81. So I, I, I sort of remember the to... time when when Dave was writing his paper. I guess. I got my dad gave me this little computer, and I remember having to save my programs on audio tapes, uh, making a terrible sound, and the connection being horribly flaky. So that half the time I had to basically rewrite the whole thing. But so that kind of got me started. Um, but I actually had a phase in between, and maybe we'll get into that later, where I was not quite decided because I, I was also um interested in economics uh, and so for a few years i kind of pursued both before i ultimately ended up in in networking what, what about you Jim? My end, i was just going to say i had a very similar experience to simone i came to cisco right out of university uh it was it's ironic because coming out of university had gotten some good marks at the top of the class and i was had a big head and i thought oh this is you know i'm all ready for this by the end of the first week i realized i knew nothing absolutely nothing and that's when it was such an important realization to make and it was very humbling experience but i think that's actually what was very valuable then and to say okay now the real learning begins because you know, the high tech industry that we work in is so far ahead of the academic uh, institutions where we learn some of the foundations that uh, it's very exciting. And then to get into that never ending learning cycle is key to uh, being successful in a field like this. Yeah, I, I can second that, Tim. Uh, like it was exactly my experience first day as well at Cisco. Just unbelievable talent and, that you realize is around and so many opportunities to learn from your peers. Yeah, I, I just I, I'm thinking back to one other one other thing. I, you got me thinking about early in early in career stuff now. And what, one of the things, one of the jobs I did, uh, one of the first jobs I ever did that I got paid for, or in my case, I kind of didn't get paid for, um, was programming computers for summer for um, quadriplegic kids. And this is the back in the days of um, you know green screens and keyboards, and these kids can't use. There, there are no mice and there's no voice control, of course. And how do you, how do you have a, a child who can't use their arms and legs interact with a computer? And so you ha kind of had to think outside the box. And one of the things we did, we, we realized that the Apple II Plus had a two button game controller input that you used to shoot down to Space Invaders. And um, so we adapted that to leaf switches, paddle switches on either side of the kid's head in a wheelchair. And I spent my whole summer programming virtual keyboards up on a screen so that these kids could interact with the, the computers and that was one of my first uh forays into technology if if you will uh, but that one of the things that i think you, you probably find common with all of us i'd say guys is that you know it's all about thinking outside the box and how to solve problems right that's a, a common a common thread that i think we all share all right yeah it's totally Absolutely. indeed and well um I know many of you have been in different roles, technologies, <laughs> and all the things, but like, how did you decide to choose this career path in particular, or the one that you are doing right now, or one of these, the 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 projects or, or, or paths that, that you have liked the most? Have you have decided to choose it? Well, uh, if I may, I, I think that go ahead, we're all working as technical marketing engineers. And I know for myself, and perhaps I, I think that I can speak for some of my uh, my esteemed peers here, is that this role is very exciting. You're always on the cutting edge. You're always figuring things out. You're writing it down. You're evangelizing and making it better. That's basically the four things that a technical marketing engineer does. 
And that continuous innovation is very attractive. The, there's never ending challenge. And then not just the challenge of solving the important customer facing problems, but then to share that knowledge effectively transmitting it so that others can benefit from it. And this has been very rewarding over the course of many different types of projects, many different types of technologies in the 20 plus years that we all seem to be working in, in this field, some of us even more so. That was, that was my thinking, but you know, I invite my <laughs> colleagues to share theirs too. No, I agree. Uh, I, I definitely agree, Tim. I mean, uh, for me, I, I started in a different role, but as soon as I started working as a technical marketing engineer, trying, you know, getting, as you said, these four different uh, things that we do, I, I, I think it's the, I mean, for me, it's my dream job. That's why, you know, I'm still here. And, and, and the fact that, you know, the, the other good thing is that we we are exposed, as you said, to new stuff. So uh, some friends are asking me, but how can you stick to the same job, right? But for me, it doesn't feel like it's the same job because I go and, and work on different technologies and then new things come up and then I have to look at different aspects. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we, we have that marketing in in uh, in the title, right? So it's not always technical. It's you relate to the the, the business as aspects, the use cases of customers, the the different vertical use cases. So that that is very interesting too, right? And uh, and gives you a, a a very wide perspective on things that which I which I love, or, or honestly. Now, what about you, Matt? Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with um, uh, Tim and Simone. I, I, I ended up in this role, I guess, uh, as so, so often in, in my life, some, in some sense, you know, through random events, right? But um, so I, I actually got into networking um, indirectly because at, at, at a one point in my life, I was really into simulation. Um, in, in particular, discrete event simulation. And um, one of the things uh, in the 90s that where this technology was applied was networks. And, and so that um, then really caught my interest in, and that's how I basically had to understand really what's going on in computer networks in order to be able to simulate it. And then everything else just basically followed from it and you know um, ended up also in a, initially in a role that was more outbound facing uh, in the Deutsche Telekom account team at Cisco. And I loved it because I, I just love interacting with customers. I, I always learn from customers. So I felt like, well, not only can I learn from my, you know, really in, uh, super intelligent colleagues, but also from customers who have real problems to solve. So, um, and then, you know, things just uh, evolve from that. And I agree with you, Simone. I've had various roles as well um in cisco from sales and product management even and and now as a technical marketing engineer um and i always find new challenges and and, and exciting things to work on and that's one of the advantages of of uh, working for a company like cisco and just yeah. for you for you matt and and well you are actually dr matthias <laughs> not many decide <laughs> to take the path of a phd so um how well, you decided then the the truth is i wanted to study as long as i could <laughs> so <laughs> um <laughs> I, I i loved university life and and i after my masters i i did go into industry and was working for this simulation company but then i thought well um I love the freedom of um of of a, a university student and and obviously also learning. I, I I just love learning, and so that's when I decided um, to basically pursue a PhD and and again ended up in 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 the, in the domain of networking. Um, so um, again, one of these more maybe random decisions. It wasn't like uh, my career goal to uh, necessarily be a, a PhD or end up at Cisco. It just happened. And I'm happy about that. That's yeah, great. I'd, 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 yeah, I'd kind of, I'd kind of echo Matt with this too. I, I'm not sure that when I, when I uh, listening to my colleagues talk, I, um, I'm not sure that I've rashly decided to say, hey, this is consciously where I want to go. I've always just um, 
in technology, always focused on the things that I'm interested in, that I'm passionate about. Uh, I try to look for unsolved problems and go after those. Um, and uh, like uh, Matt and Simone and Tim, we all enjoy working with customers. Like when I joined Cisco, I joined as a, a system engineer. Um, I was an SE for what, 13, 14 years inside Cisco, working with large customers in Canada where I am and, and across the world. And um, you know, then I switched over to product teams inside Cisco about uh, six or seven years ago, because I was really passionate about working in a particular area, which is on platforms and ASICs and silica and all the stuff that we're doing there. And um, it's also an area where we can make a huge contribution and take the things that we learn from our customers and interacting with them and turn those into, into real consumable uh, products and solutions, right? And that's really what I've always been passionate about. But I wouldn't say that I ever consciously sat down and said, hey, this is, you know, I'm going to do this because I want to get to that goal. It's always I want to do this because I'm passionate about it. Well, thank you very much. For and what, I have a question that is actually really important. How did you meet and how you decided to collaborate together? Do you remember? <laughs> well, that's an easy one. I do. Um, I do. Yeah, we're all on the same team. <laughs> Oh, no, go, go, Tim. We, ha we were all on the same team, and it's actually, you know, at that time when we were all on the same team, it was one of my favorite times at Cisco. If I had to choose four people to make a team uh, to work on any project, I would handpick this very team. We, 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 very, we work very well together, but we really enjoy each other at the same time. And so that's a wonderful combination. And it really makes us, you know, productive, effective, as well as you have fun in the process. So um, when our manager, we reported to, I think you have a slide on this coming up. Um, our manager said, you know what, we're reaching into a new space here. We're covering some brand new territory. We're like, you know, cutting the path through the jungle, trailblazing, and we need to not just figure this out, but capture that and and write it down so that uh, we, others can understand what is this architecture that we're developing overall so that they too can not only help build it, but then also deploy it. So uh, that's where we started uh, this particular project and engagement. Awesome. And for instance, when, when you were preparing this publication, like uh, what kind of challenges you find or which topics you find more interesting? Yeah, I think we've got a bunch of stuff in the presentation that we'll talk about the challenges yeah. that, that, okay. that, that we that we ran into. So we'll we'll definitely <laughs> illustrate that and and also some of in the you know the, yeah some of the things that really motivated us to you know to tackle this subject. Great. Well, then uh, if that is the case, uh, let's <laughs> move on. And my final question before we move on onto the presentation and you provide more details is. Uh, and please keep that in mind what you present as well is why would you recommend this Cisco's digital network architecture book um, for people who is in networking and technology? Okay, I'll, I'll, would, I'll take a first yeah. step. Why? Because yeah. it's the biggest step forward in networking in at least 20 years. You know, we've been built with Cisco has been, I think, around for 36 years. We've been building networks in a certain way and what we now refer to as a legacy way of doing things and this was a revolutionary new approach it's not just an incremental marginal evolutionary thing but it's a complete turning and ideas on their head and a really big step forward and therefore you know being on the cusp of that on the forefront of that um, figuring it out and then writing all that down and sharing it is very valuable uh, for everyone that's able to, you know, to, to read the book and be exposed to the information. It will make their jobs easier as network engineers, as IT support people, or whatever their role is, planners, uh, application administrators, any, anyone, because it really is about digitally transforming the enterprise and the tools that allow you to do so. So that's that's how I would recommend uh, this book. It's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a significant milestone in networking. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Tim. I, I think one of, uh, from my perspective, and, and obviously I'm biased, but uh, I think w what I like about what we achieved is that it has a good balance of sort of architectural concepts that are innovative uh, and forward-looking. 
um, but then also uh, examples of how you can realize it today with some of our products and solutions. So it's not just a book that explains a certain Cisco technology. It has this visionary architectural um, view as well. And, and I think that's that's pretty valuable. Yeah, and that architectural view needs to evolve as we encompass new technologies yeah. going forward, right? So that's one of the things about the DNA framework is that it lets us, you know, things like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence come along. They slot in as natural extensions into the architecture. But I think we needed at that time, we needed a framework. We need to define this framework and that wasn't there before. So I think that's that's why this book is important, I think. That's actually a great segue for the slides, no? Yes. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the part of the interview. And now it's time for digital network architecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide the, the presenters role uh, to Dave. So you guys can start sharing like more details about cool. DNA. So yeah, uh, so hopefully in the, in the last few minutes that we went through, you got a uh, chance to meet the five of us, uh, or the four of us, I should say. The fifth person that we um, did we talked about, but uh, it was not actually part of writing the book, but was our strong motivator to write the book, was our manager, Mark Montanez. And Mark was really the, uh, I would say, the instigator of the project and really prompted us to get it going by pointing out the fact that we had this our architectural shift that was underway with uh, Cisco DNA and said, there needs to be somebody who takes pen to paper to write this down and to capture this. And so that Mark was really the uh, the driving force behind us uh, getting started with the book. He and, got uh, us into and, his trouble, yeah. Yeah, he got us into his trouble. And then uh, what Mark would often do, uh, Mark was a, a, a great enabler of people. He would see the potential for what people could do, and then he would enable you to get started with that. He'd enable you, he'd motivate you, and in, in my point of view, a fantastic manager. I'd say, um, you know, probably my my favorite manager at Cisco, certainly. Um, but but Dave, I, I wanted to sorry to interrupt. I wanted to call yeah. out Tim as well because when we made the decision to write a book, Tim came with a wealth of experience with Cisco Press, mm -hmm. and so he just. Uh, I guess uh, paved the way in many in many aspects. Uh, as a novel author, you would have we would have had a lot more hurdles to overcome if if we ha we couldn't have relied on Tim's experience because he's he's written the book on quality of service. Quality uh, of service. What is it? And it's like tenth edition now, a two thousand page book. Um, no, and, no. And so just no. having that experience in the team with Tim, I, from my perspective, helped a lot. Yeah, no, I agree. That was fantastic. Tim, Tim Mark motivated us. Tim enabled us to be right. successful with us. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. Tim. That's a good one. Yeah, Tim, Tim, Tim was our captain as we kind of went into this this journey, <laughs> and and one of, one of the things we definitely found along the way is how to stress a friendship. In uh, you know, because we were all friends. We're all on the same team. We're all good friends going into this process. But one of the things we found is that writing a book together is an excellent way to stress test a friendship because you'll all have different opinions about how to write the book. You'll all have different writing styles. You will all have different uh, uh, contributions into it. So one of the things we find is that, you know, one person might describe a subject in 10 pages. Another person might describe their subject that they're writing about in 50 pages and you can't really have that in the book you need some sort of balance right so it was a constant give and take through this process and it, I, I i'm sure we all remember this well guys i do i do and uh it, it was but as you said it was uh, also fun at the same time but but yes we we had some interesting discussion for sure yeah, yeah. And it, and it took a while. It wasn't it wasn't an overnight thing, by any means. And I had to deal with three Canadians, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an Italian dealing awesome. with three Canadians. That you put also the culture difference there. We had you. We had you outnumbered, Simone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so, so this was so, you know, this was a great experience that we that we all went through. Um, but it's not an easy experience to write a book. It, it's not an easy experience to write a book by yourself. And actually, when you bring in you know multiple different perspectives, you still want a cohesive story and you want to flow uh, through the book. And that's one of the things that we had to gel together to figure out how to make that work. And uh, it was it was it was a fun process, but some parts of it at the time didn't seem like fun <laughs> as we were working through it. Um, so one of the things that uh, we kind of based this around was that um, uh, uh, prior to us coming out with Cisco DNA architecture, I, I'm a big believer in visual representations of things. I always try to draw pictures of things. And so this is one of the kind of a simplified view of a typical enterprise network that we would see, uh, you know, back in the day, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, where you see lots of different things in here. You see wired, you see wireless overlay, all the CAPWAP tunnels, that's the yellow lines running in there, multiple different types of WAN providers, data center to connect, connections out to cloud, uh, out to the internet, VPN, remote teleworking, campus designs, all sorts of stuff that goes into this. And this is one of the goals that DNA really set out to solve is how can we simplify and scale this environment, right? That's really one of the, the goals that, uh, that DNA set out for. So uh, uh, anybody, and we've all been in networking for a long period of time, we're all familiar with the fact that networks can be very, very complex when you start thinking about all the elements that go in them. And uh, so this is one of the goals that we set out to to address uh, with DNA. Um, Matt, do you want to talk yeah, about I, a little I bit think, about? I think Dave, this this was actually the picture that that got us into trouble as well, right? Because yes. when, when you draw drew it, and we try to figure out well, what's the evolution? Everybody went, oh my God, this is like you know, we need to do something. Right, um, and and it basically uh, you know inspired then uh, a whole uh, movement within Cisco around the digital network architecture, where we basically said, hey, we got to break it down into uh, much easier to understand building blocks, and we came up. Actually, our marketing friends came up with the, sort of this slide, and said, hey, we should build an architecture that uh, basically has physical and virtual infrastructure at, at, at its foundation, but which uh, highlights very much the, the concepts of automation and analytics, uh, analytics as well as, as cloud uh, service management. So um, uh, basically at that time, um, from my perception, um, our, our friends in Cisco marketing did a fantastic job at picking up the idea of simplification, and they came up with uh, uh, this high-level concept of Cisco digital network architecture that then also gave rise to intent-based networking. If you flick to the next slide, please. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure you guys have all seen uh, the next slide, hopefully by now many times, because it's been one of the key anchor slides um, in enterprise networking uh, for at least five years. Um, that, that nicely highlights our uh, strategy to basically uh, deliver network solutions where uh, we automate the capabilities uh, uh, of intent into the network infra infrastructure. We um, then uh, make sure that that uh, network is secure. We continuously extract information from the infrastructure to derive context and learn from it, um, and which basically gave rise to sort of the development of Cisco DNA Center and its policy automation and, and analytics capabilities. So, um, you know, Dave, in some sense, started this off with his simplified version of the enterprise network architecture, but then we found ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a, a situation where uh, our marketing teams were uh, really executing um, uh, super well. And, and at one point, um, Mark and um, uh, the, my, my three amigos here, we, we sat, uh, I guess it was somewhere uh, over a beer, and we thought, how do we actually build this? Like, how, what is the architecture where if somebody says, yeah, I want to buy Cisco digital network architecture, how do you build it? And so while we had an idea, we thought we need to do a better job at uh, basically describing uh, more from a technical perspective uh, what the Cisco Digital Network Architecture is. And it basically uh, led to a, an inaugural meeting in, in September 2016 in Vancouver. Uh, so 
Tim hosted us uh, and 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 um, and Dave. Uh, Dave and Dave in, in their Dave. hometown, beautiful city. Uh, and we locked ourselves into a room in the Cisco office in in Vancouver. Oh, uh, um, don't forget, don't forget the fact that we had some great Italian wine to start with. That's always a good precursor to creative activity. Uh, you know, exactly. so we, 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 you have to you also know. recognize that Cisco is a very frugal company when it comes to travel. So if two of us live in one city and the other two have to travel, that's better than three people traveling, which would be any other scenario. So right. yes, the city itself is you know very enjoyable and we were very happy to host our friends, uh, but that was also a deciding factor in it. Otherwise, I would have been fine going to Italy and working there with uh, Simone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and especially, I mean, Simone already showed his, his, his value to the team here, you know, with the Italian wine selection, so... Yes, um, we but were was, really happy to have Simone on the team. We we started with but, the, the, the the you know with the right food because if you started with some French wines, welcoming me with some French wines, that would have got us not really with the right. <laughs> <laughs> we needed something more. We needed something more robust. That's what you're saying, Simone. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, so then after, after we went through that, it came time to, to buckle down and get to work. So uh, basically, how long were we locked in this room together, Tim, uh, initially? 12 hours a day for five days straight. That room needed like a steam clean by the time we were done at the end of the week. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was pretty intense. And this was just a start, right? We just, by no means, when you come out of that week, have you finished the book, but at least you've got a plan. Right. And so that's really what we started to do is work through the brainstorming uh, process in this in terms of, you know, what do, how do we put the book together? What does the structure need to look like? What's the what's the story we need to tell? What's a flow? And uh, I know we're we're all big believers in um, if you've ever uh, seen that that uh, uh, presentation given by Simon Sinek called The Power of Why, uh, where you start with why. Right. He's actually got a book called Start With Why. You start with why you're doing it, then you talk about how you're doing it, and finally you talk about what, right? What you're delivering to the market. And that was kind of the flow that really helped us to explain everything. But we had to, we didn't start off with that, right? We had to brainstorm to get through yeah, that. I, so that I, was I really the, our, the start of that. Our ambition was to actually do some writing in Vancouver, but we never got there because we um, right. um, kind of had some fundamental discussions about, you know, what does the architecture look like from a technical perspective? So just to come right. up with uh, this outline that is shown in uh, on the whiteboard here, and then the next slide, um, uh, Dave, that, that was basically how we spent the first... Um, um, week in Vancouver in in long long and discussions about how do we articulate and 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 under underline the different layers the different functional blocks uh, I guess as we call them in the the DNA architecture obviously uh, accommodating infrastructure but then also justifying a controller layer a, a maybe more end to end orchestration layer the analytics piece. Uh, how to tie it all together with APIs, which we, which is a, a key concept in in DNA. Um, there was there was a lot of uh, brainwaves that went into this picture and and the next one where we basically then um, uh, try to show the idea of a, a closed loop automation cycle that I, I guess we're slowly moving towards. But um, you know, at the time when we wrote it was actually uh, very innovative, this idea of, of having closed loop automation in a, in a network architecture. So what do you mean by closed loop automation, Matt? Um, well, so the, the idea is to um, uh, basically have the ability, first of all, in, in intent-based networking to express what the network uh, should do in order to deliver certain services, to automate the, that intent into the network infrastructure. And there's a, a number of translations that need to happen from a, a high level expressed intent into an actual device configuration that can be understood by let's say a router or a switch. But one of the key ideas in the uh, digital network architecture and intent-based networking is that we continuously collect information from the network 
we analyze it, we do analytics on it, we correlate, we run statistical uh, algorithms, um, maybe even machine learning. But really what, what the idea is at the, at the end of the day is to say, how does this, this intelligence that we gather back from the network relate back to the original intent that was expressed? And, and, and that is the first, let's say, element of closing the loop is to say, I wanna make sure that the actually, uh, network actually delivers on the intent that I, I, I expressed in the first place. Now, Mark actually went even a step further because in his uh, mind, closed loop op automation then went another step or maybe two or three, if you want to argue, in saying, hey, if I know what the cause, let's say the intent is not met, I need to be able to, to identify what the cause of that mismatch is and ideally even get to a stage where the network self-corrects. And that's still kind of the, the, the vision that we, we've, I think we've got certain proof points right now where this can be achieved, but certainly not yet, uh, from my perspective, a well-deployed practice. But, but that sort of, again, back to the point of where we uh, uh, already thought a lot about architectural concepts and not only product capabilities in writing the book. Yep, yep. absolutely. So uh, let's talk through the individual pieces that we each can kind of contribute into the book. And, and maybe I'll kick off and start talking about uh, just very briefly about what we do with uh, silicon and ASICs and all that kind of stuff. And the reason we kind of maybe want to start there is because that is the foundational components that go into our equipment that control our ability to deliver on a lot of aspects of this vision. Now, anybody who knows me knows that somewhere in my presentation, there will be a picture of a rocket or a high performance aircraft. And because I'm really excited and interested in those things, but I'll also put a hashtag on here. So I'm gonna try and go through the next slides at a very rapid rate and just give you a kind of an idea about ASICs and their importance. So you'll constantly see Cisco engineer or Cisco exec standing on stage and saying ASICs are a pillar of Cisco innovation. I think that's absolutely true. But there were some very exciting things happening around the time that we created this book. We made the movement as a company from traditional ASIC silicon, which was fixed in nature and might not be able to handle new protocols and new encapsulations. In other words, a traditional ASIC, when you present a packet to it, runs that packet through a fixed series of steps in the ASIC. We're all familiar with this, right? Like IPv4, IPv6 lookups, ACLs, QoS, et cetera. But the functionality that we've typically looked at for many years, for decades in networking ASICs is fixed functionality. And that's okay when things aren't changing very rapidly. When we're always building networks the same way, you, a traditional networking ASIC, a fixed function ASIC is fine. But one of the common threads that you've seen through discussion, maybe in the last uh, short bit, is that things are changing rapidly in a network. We're giving analytics and automation requirements, security requirements are evolving. We see these requirements for, you know, end-to-end -end policies, network-wide assurance, and this in turn drove new protocols to kind of realize that vision that we're laying out in DNA, things like a VXLAN and LISP and TrustSec. And the challenge with traditional ASIC silicon that we saw at the time was a, a bunch of these functions might not be supported in hardware. And if you have to support them in software, the performance is gonna drop so dramatically, it's simply not practical in a high-speed network device. So what do you do? And what Cisco did was evolve to the concept of a programmable ASIC, something an ASIC that can be reprogrammed through microcode to adapt to new protocols and new encapsulations, literally replacing all the different steps within that pipeline with flexibility, a flexible parser to understand what the protocols are when they come in, flexible lookup stages, flexible rewriters, all reprogrammable through microcode. And that gives us the ability not just to handle the things we know about like V4 and V6, but most importantly to handle the new protocols that we don't know about because maybe those protocols haven't even been invented yet. In fact, I, I like to joke that, you know, it's not just about things like uh, adding in VXLAN, although we added support for that when the protocol was invented and it wasn't originally there in the chip. But I like to joke if IPv7 were invented tomorrow, and we hope it's not because it's taken the industry many years to get to IPv6, but if V7 were invented tomorrow, we probably have enough flexibility in these chips to, to handle it. And that was very exciting because this means that as we come out with these new visions and these new desires that we want to execute within an architecture like DNA, we can realize that in the underlying hardware. And one of the things you see is this flexible silicon, it kind of started in the Cat9K in the 3850 and 3650 with a chip that we called U80P, that's, that's this ASIC uh, right here, the, U, the U80P ASIC. 
Um, and that's a foundation for the entire Catalyst 9000 family now, but also this similar level of programmability that we saw with another chip we developed called Quantum Flow, which is the basis for the ASR1K, and also Silicon One architecture, which is the basis for the, the Cisco 8000. All of these share this common trait of being programmable, and that's absolutely key when it comes to realizing this, this uh, innovation that we want to drive within DNA, because we have to be able to do it onto existing platforms that customers already have in your network. We can't ask you every time a new innovation comes out to go rip and replace your entire network. That's just not going to happen. So this, this concept of flexible silicon was absolutely key. And this really enabled us to uh, produce a solution like software defined access, fundamentally based on some of the technologies I talked about, like TrustSec and VXLAN and Lisp, but very critically, make a solution like this backwards compatible onto hardware that had shipped in some cases years before, like a Catalyst 3850 and 3650, uh, as well as more modern hardware like Cat 9K. So this was this was really key. It's really exciting. In terms of the book, I wrote a bunch of chapters in the book talking about protocol evolution and hardware evolution, ASIC evolution. Um, and then Simone, why don't you talk about wireless and what we did with wireless in the book? Right. I, I have to keep on reminding you you guys during the book that who cares about wired anymore right <laughs> that was my main my main pitch every time who cares so well you're at, the, access, the access point has to plug into a wire ultimately so. <laughs> I no i and uh, i i definitely wrote about the wireless at least that was my expertise coming into this uh team but i was the last one coming to the team if you remember guys so I, I don't know if you remember, but when we were in front of that whiteboard and we were assigning who writes what, and there was some chapters that were like, hmm, nobody has a real expertise for this. Uh, I remember the cloud one, the analytics one, you know, this was really unexplored territory at that time. And uh, and I guess the, the last one arrived that had the privilege to 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 go and figure it out, but it, it was good. It, it it was really it was really good for me because uh, I learned something something new. So, but but at the same time, you know, um, as we said, the we we wrote the framework, but a lot of things are happening uh, uh, within, for example, the wireless solution from from the time that we. Uh, we brought the book, we completely refresh the, um, the, the wireless stack, but what, what I like about, uh, and that makes the, the book still very much valid is that the approach that we, we follow, right? That those principle of DNA and intent based networking are very much relevant from everything we do today and how we develop products and solutions, right? So. For example, for, for wireless, we have now uh, the new Wi-Fi 6 uh, Catalyst access point where we have embedded uh, our own RF programmable ASIC. So guess what? What um, uh, they show you about programmable ASIC and the value they bring for the wired infrastructure, we brought the same advantage in uh, in the Catalyst APs. And, and and this also relate to what Matt was saying before about enabling the uh, the infrastructure to continuously collect deep analytics, right? That only a, a, a an ASIC can can allow you to do. So so for example, some of this um, analytics, if uh, then get gets delivered yes. to DNA center to DNA spaces, for example. But this is an example, right? How we use it. So we partner with uh, with the device vendor, Apple, Samsung, Intel, so that the their clients behave better on a Cisco uh, on a Cisco on a Cisco wireless network. And the reason is we the the devices talk to the infrastructure. For example, here. You, you see, this is a, a, a screenshot from, from the assurance part where the device tells us what is its uh, state machine for onboarding. And if it, there is a problem, for example, in onboarding, in this case with the DHCP, it tells us where it got stuck. And, and this is a huge, huge benefit. 
but it doesn't uh, end here because, for example, if you consider random Mac, now all these uh, devices to protect your privacy are using randomized Mac, which kind of defeat the purpose of a lot of uh, profiling solution that are based on Mac. Uh, Mac is the first, definitely the, the first element that is uh, yeah. used to be uh, the identification of the device on a network. Right? But as you can see here, both of these devices are using randomized Mac, but we are able to classify them. And the reason why we're able to classify is because these devices, um, you know, talk to the infrastructure, to the Cisco infrastructure, and, and do provide their identity. So that's, again, uh, the, the power of, of analytics. And, and really, so, so we, we don't see the access point as purely connectivity, but again, the DNA principle are going down and influencing how we make a, a, an access point, which is kind of the uh, bringing together, you know, programmable ASIC and a software architecture, in this case, allowing the IOX framework, bringing, you know, Docker style application directly on the AP and the first one we have released recently is a BLE gateway so that you don't need, if you have an IoT network, you don't need to build a completely separate infrastructure. So the Catholic, Catholic AP is really a, not, not just a, a, an access point connectivity provider, it is more a multi-purpose platform. And then to close the loop, as uh, Matt uh, was saying, right? So this information, and this is a quote, from a, a partner that I work here in uh, in um, in Europe. This is uh, how this information that we gather continuously from the devices, the network devices, not only the access point, but also the switches, the routers, you know, and then we 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 use it to run machine learning and to uh, basically uh, determine what is normal for your network so that we can actually detect when there is an anomaly and report it back. So in this case, you know, it would have taken so long to identify the, 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 the problem, but it actually, by looking at logs and doing the normal troubleshooting, this was identified very, very quick uh, yes. by looking at this, uh, you know, uh, AI driven assurance. Yeah, so um, when we were in Vancouver in that uh, inaugural one week session, um, I was the lucky winner to um, look after the uh, controller orchestration and policy parts of the architecture. And um, I always felt very strong that we needed to articulate that really well, uh, because one of the key, uh, after all, one of the, the, the key concepts in uh, intent based networking is to have a layer where you can abstract uh, intent, capture it. And uh, we, as we were writing the book, we were already very much on the way in developing the, the Cisco, Cisco DNA Center for the, the, the campus area. So um, I basically took on that part in the, in the writing process. Um, but I was also very much helped by uh, my friend Tim here because uh, in his uh, prior work, uh, he, he basically laid the foundation for a lot of thinking uh, on policy, along with obviously uh, concepts that then Dave and Mark uh, drove into, and Simone drove into the Cisco software-defined access architecture. And the idea that uh, I remember Tim made some fantastic slides about is to say, when we look at intent, and let's take the example of quality of service intent, right, what really matters is not whether a particular uh, application gets classified with a certain DSCP value or um, what uh, a priority scheme uh, you configure in, uh, let's say, a, a Cisco router or a switch. But what matters to many people who are using the network is whether that application is business relevant, irrelevant, or, or default. And, and Tim, uh, along with others in his work, have actually standardized that in a number of uh, IETF RFCs, and, and to me, that's sort of the epitome of a, a, an example of intent-based networking. So I had the pleasure then to uh, write a few chapters about um, uh, policy in general, 
um, how we take those abstractions from an uh, abstracted intent capture that we in, in, in our current form do in, in DNA Center with some very nice, easy to use workflows, but how that then translates into different policy constructs uh, in the underlying domain, uh, such as access policies governing who can get into the network, this notion of access control policies, uh, who can talk to whom, leveraging the uh, scalable group tags, um, maybe also then implementing the application policy that I just talked about, or even thinking about other abstractions in policy, such as traffic copy policy. Um, so I actually had a lot of fun writing this chapter because I feel so passionate about it. Um, and one of the things we realized that um, uh, the, and we wanted to underline as well is that Cisco DNA is, is not restricted to only the campus. It's actually an architecture uh, in the abstract sense that spans the entire enterprise network from the access SSID uh, to placate uh, Simone or port for, for Dave, all the way to where the applications sit predominantly nowadays maybe in a virtual private cloud environment or even in a, in a, in a SaaS environment with the SaaS vendors. So the, the concepts we built into the act, uh, architecture uh, are absolutely applicable in this entire uh, uh, structure uh, of the, the different domains, the, the campus domains, the WAN, data center as well, public or private clouds. Uh, and, and in order to um, put a little more spotlight on that, we also obviously incorporated Cisco SD1 in this architecture. Um, so uh, that's another chapter that I contributed to the book. But I wanted and, Tim some uh, more time because uh, <laughs> he uh, actually no, had the coolest job, uh, and and he is the master of analogies. And I'll I'll uh, let him explain uh, this notion, this this reference to pirates and icebergs. Oh sure, okay, so. Um... Thanks, Matt. Um, basically, there's so much data that can be generated in the network. For instance, the UADP chip that Dave held up, how many flexible counters, Dave? Is it 16,000 flexible counters no. if memory serves? No, uh, more than uh, significantly more than that, Tim. A lot how more. How many? Uh, okay. well, it depends, on, it depends, it depends, it depends on the version of the chip, but a couple of hundred thousand. Okay. Part, oh, sorry, you're right. Three. I remember one of the versions, one of the generations had 384,000, I believe. Yeah, depends, anyway, so basically, there's a lot of data that can be generated. That's a, that's a starting point. And with data, when it's that much data, to me, and maybe this is a very Canadian analogy, it's like being blinded by snowflakes in a snowstorm. If you've ever been in a blizzard, and there's so many of these coming at you, you don't see, like when a snowflake is by itself and it's coming down, you kind of appreciate it, and you, you see something, you recognize something, but when there's so much coming at you, you see nothing. It's like a whiteout. And that's basically what our network will do. It'll provide so much data, it's just overwhelming. And so as a result, we have to find patterns in that data. And from those patterns, we have to distinguish, okay, there's three main reasons for patterns. Either it's a pure dumb luck coincidence, or there is maybe correlation, or the gold nugget is causation. You know, if one thing causes another, then we can control and we can remediate and we can take action if we know about that causation. But sometimes those distinctions are hard to appreciate and recognize. And not everybody remembers, certain, for instance, their Statistics 101. So here's an analogy that I like to use to try and make that distinction between correlation and causation. On this graph, what we have on the y-axis is the average global temperature uh, for the last few hundred years. You can see that uh, it's basically it's getting warmer. There is data behind that. I know some people don't think so or still denying that data, but it's getting warmer. Now, on the x-axis, we've plotted the number of pirates in the world. And this is not like software pirates. These are like the regular Shiver Me Timbers, Johnny Depp, Captain Sparrow pirates that are actually like on ships stealing treasure from other people. Well, the number of pirates keeps declining. If you just plot those two random um, relationships, those two variables against each other, you see a very strong pattern. 
It's an inverse correlation. As the number of pirates are going down, the global temperature is going up. That's a very strong relationship. But is that correlation or is it causation? I think everybody gets the point that it's not causation because then we could simply solve global warming by encouraging more of our kids to uh, pursue a, a career in piracy. So, you know, making some of these types of points it, sometimes whenever you can in an entertaining way, we find it really helps people to understand then the, the challenges that we're facing and why we have to make these types of distinctions so that we get led to the right reasons for something happening or not. And this all has to be not only understood by the engineers, but then also expressed and implemented in our algorithms, such as our machine learning and AI algorithms, because that's the only way you can assimilate and find the patterns in that much data. It's just beyond human capabilities. Anyways, some fun stuff. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the keys is that the architecture that is defined by DNA is flexible enough to accommodate these new technologies as they came along. Like when we started writing this book, there was not really the concept of incorporating machine learning for this, but obviously machine learning and AI has become huge in the last few years, and it absolutely applies to this problem space. Right. Um, so ultimately we came out with the book. Took us a while to write it, but we, when it came out, this is a picture of us selling our very first book to John A. This was at Cisco Live in Barcelona in 2019. Uh, who wants to talk about this picture? I think Tim, I think Tim, who who was it that sold that sold John A on buying our first book? Yeah, well, we we were all there as you can see, and John Aposopoulos, our enterprise CTO, just a fantastic guy, brilliant guy, and you know he's like, oh, I don't even have this book yet. And if you remember that um, I talked about how Cisco is very frugal, and he's like, well. Maybe I can expense it. And we're like, of course you can, because your boss, he reports to Scott Harrell, our senior VP, that's the GM of Enterprise. Uh, he actually wrote the forward. So we didn't think he'd have any trouble expensing that book. But we actually had to have a conversation to talk him into expensing our book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then uh, going forward at Cisco Live uh, last year, the meet the author event. This is one of our favorite things. I think I can safely speak for all of us on the team. One of our favorite things is being at events like Cisco Live and meeting with customers, interacting with customers. That's where we learn so much from, you know, uh, what we're doing, where we're falling short, new things that we need to add, um, always from interactions with customers. That's where you where you learn and Cisco Live is just a, a fantastic venue. Uh, and coming up so this, um, uh, next week, isn't it? Um... Yes, absolutely. Yes, Cisco Live Worldwide event coming up next week. And I think we all have presentations that we're doing or involved with different events that are happening next week at Cisco Live. So you see us all in our various different roles uh, doing things at Cisco Live. This is absolutely, for, for me, going to Cisco Live and interacting with our customers, meeting our friends from around the world. Um, this has always been one of the highlights of the year. Absolutely. You know, funny, funny story back in the day when Cisco Live, before Cisco Live was called Cisco Live, it used to be called Networkers. And I actually ended up joining Cisco because of attending a Networkers event. I joined Cisco in 90, 1999, but a couple of years before that, Cisco Live or Networkers, as it was known then, was in Vancouver. And um, as you can do at Cisco Live, you attend different events. I attended a troubleshooting EIGRP of a class, like a 3000 level class by uh, given by a gentleman named Don Slice, who was one of our lead escalation engineers in TAC. And as you can do at Cisco Live after he presented, I hung out in the hallway with him for probably an hour, hour and a half afterwards, and we had a great technical conversation. And I wasn't working for Cisco yet. And I asked him at one point, what's it like to work at Cisco? And the answer he gave me convinced me I needed to come work for the company. Uh, he basically said that he had the best job in the world because every day people handed him big broken networks. He was the lead escalation engineer for EIGRP and TAC. Every day people handed him big broken networks and he got to be the person that fixed them. And what a, and what a privilege that was for him. And I thought if there's people like that working at Cisco, then that's where I need to go because that, those are the, the kind of people I wanna work around. And uh, through working at Cisco, I've had the fantastic right. privilege of meeting uh, Tim and Matt and Simone and uh, and 
working together on this book and lots of other projects. So uh, why don't you take us a little bit, who wants to take us a little bit through the what we learned slide uh, through writing the book? You, you want to talk about how easy it is to write a book, Matt? Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, the, the one of the first things and, uh, that, that we had to basically uh, grapple with was, was we all have different writing styles. And, and you probably can still, in some sense, detect who wrote which, which chapter. I, I think I certainly was on one end of the spectrum because I was more of a, a let's say, less flavorful, uh, less colorful writer and more trying to be more to the point. And um, so I had to adopt my writing style as well to to bring it in line with the, uh, the level that the, the my friends here brought. But yeah, that was certainly a challenge. I think that also cost a bit of time, right, overall to make sure that we um, we, we it's it somehow reads reads a, a more coherent yeah yeah and uh maybe tim do you want to talk a little bit about architecture yeah this is so fundamental like uh, in the chat room by the way guys help me out with uh q a there's a couple of questions uh day one on lisp that i think you're better qualified sure. but this question has yep, already sure. come up in the chat yep. Like, how do we write something that's continuing to change? And that was very frustrating because, you know, as soon as you write it and then you go through so many rounds of review, technical review, even just uh, language review, uh, layout review, and all this stuff all takes time. And by the time you're ready to, like, carve it in stone and put it on a shelf uh, in a bookstore, you know, things have changed. But this is why the architecture was so important to lay out because the architecture doesn't change. You know, so if you look at, say, you know, how a car is built, you know, there's some main critical components. You know, there's an engine, there are four wheels, there's a steering, there's transmission, etc. Sometimes that architecture can change radically. That's what we had. Basically, what we had is kind of like a car, like a Tesla, where everything has changed. It's not a gasoline-based internal combustion engine. It's now electric motors. But... You know, laying out what that art, new architecture is, is what we've done. And then even though there's many new models, you know, the Tesla X, the Tesla S, and so on and so forth, they all fall into this new architecture, and therefore it gives the book longevity. So this is what we endeavored to do. And so to the question of how did we, you know, um, address, you know, the evolving aspects of it, it's by laying out that architectural framework, giving the current state of affairs, but then seeing that, okay, once you understand this, you will understand all the other expressions, the indiscreet models, if you will, that will still fall and comply with that architecture. Cool. And Simone, since uh, you're the Italian working with three Canadians, do you want to address this point about diversity of characters? No, I, I think that's uh, that's true uh, for uh, not only for writing the book. This is true uh, in everyday life, right? Uh, and and we have a privilege to to be able to experience that uh, every day at work, right? So I, I think that's I think we. Uh, Dave, I think we we need to rush because we are already over time. Yep. So let's. Yep. I uh, just say, yeah, that you know we we've been doing this for a while now. Obviously, been you know working this for a few years. And the uh, only thing I'd wrap up by saying is that at the end of this process, years later, we're all still friends, right? We're all still friends and still focused on our different areas and helping to bring this architecture out to reality. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap. Unless anybody has some final thoughts. Oh, I don't know if you have any final thoughts. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, all the experts for sharing like this, uh, not only your story, but like this is the first time that we see uh, jokes and, and how you really felt about the book. And uh, I really appreciate that. Actually, all the audience really appreciate it. Many have said like, this is fun and this is really nice. So thank you very much. And to the audience to making this possible. I know we have overpassed the time and we apologize for that, but we hope this information is useful for you. Remember that the recording, the slides and all the questions related to this audience will be available at the event page where you just register. At this moment, we don't have uh, time just to clarify other questions, but we will make sure to put all of them together, answer them and place it at the event uh, 
uh, at events page. Uh, here you will find some other extra resources and reference that can, can you have related to, to this topic and on Cisco Press and Cisco.com. And uh, also, this is uh, the moment that many of you were looking for and would like to announce the winners. So I'm placing them on the chat and remember we'll be contacting you uh, uh, via email, just using the email that you used to register. So the first book goes to John LeBron and the other one goes to Carl Reimer. Both of them are in America, so congratulations guys. Thank you so much for joining. You, yeah, you will have a signed book and we will contact you via email to gather all the details to make it happen. Uh, also, please help us out to fill out the survey. It, it will come out once you you close the session or we close the session and it helps us out to improve. Let us know what kind of authors you would like to see, how we did, if you like this experience and many other things. And just for those of you who didn't got the chance to actually win a book, we have great news. Uh, we talked with uh, Cisco Press and they are giving us a special offer, which I just placed on the chat. Uh, so you can have a 40% discount in, in print books, 50% discount on ebooks, and 60% on any video training by using the code Cisco DNA. That is available on the chat, so if you didn't got the chance to win the book, don't worry. You can get it like uh, on Cisco Press or you can get any other material as well. So once again, thank you very much, Dave, Matt, uh, Simone and Tim for joining us today. It has been such a great session. I really had a good time and so has the audience. And I wish all of you had a wonderful time and a great Easter time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. See you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Great seeing you all. Bye-bye. Right. Yeah.